Hello and welcome to episode two of the Protection Dog Podcast, where we provide an alternative to conventional dog training and philosophy. So today we are going to be talking about my opinion on the major differences in how dogs can be trained. So in other words, what do you want the end result to be? What are the major differences? And then we'll wrap up with, or we'll probably, it'll probably be sprinkled all throughout, is why we do things the way that we do them based on my uh, understanding of the differences between the dog training methodologies. All right, <clears throat> so that's what we're gonna be talking about. But first, this episode is sponsored by Canine Academy Online. So Canine Academy Online is making dog training easy. We have local dog training uh, classes in Orlando, Florida. So if you happen to be a listener from Orlando, Florida, uh, check us out and we would love for you to come out and train with us in Oviedo, which is just north of Orlando. And um, we also, though, for everyone else, have an online training course um, at canineacademyonline.com and that is the letter K, the number nine, academyonline.com. We train obedience, service dogs, tracking, protection, tactical dogs, advanced off-lead obedience, and a ton more. We're constantly building that uh, library up. Uh, it's interactive on our private Facebook group if you have questions or you're running into problems. And uh, we're, so we're also building what I call the problem solving library, which is, okay, I'm following your method, but my dog is doing this, right? Whatever this is. And, uh, and then we uh, will help you to work through those issues. Uh, a lot of times we're misreading the dogs when they're doing things. And as soon as we understand what it is they're doing, it, uh, everything just kind of starts to come together again. So, um, you can find out more about Canine Academy online uh, by visiting their website. Again, that is the letter K, the number nine, academyonline.com, canineacademyonline.com. Uh, email us at joel at canineacademyonline.com. Uh, you can also send me uh, a text at 813-836-9244. And you'll notice I'm saying send me a text and not give me a call at that number because if I don't recognize the number, I almost never answer it. So um, if you would like to chat with me, uh, you can give me, send me a text message, uh, let me know what you'd like to talk about, and, uh, and then when, and if I'm able to, because uh, I do this while I'm driving, but when I'm not driving, I am often very, very busy. Uh, so, um, but if I'm able to connect with you and uh, talk via the phone, uh, then I would be happy to do that with you there. And, uh, and then you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Canine Academy Online. So on Facebook, that would be at Canine Academy Online, as well as Instagram. And then again, we don't have our private URL on YouTube yet, uh, but you can search Canine Academy Online, find our page and subscribe to that there so that you don't miss any of our training videos. And we try to put up uh, weekly training videos on both the Fortress K9 YouTube channel as well as the K9 Academy YouTube channel. And then I record this podcast uh, at least once a week and uh, try to keep these coming to you every week as well. All right, so let's get into today's topic. I'm in a traffic jam, so I'm gonna try and switch over to that page without having an accident here. Woohoo, look at that, success. <clears throat> All right. So first of all, let me just start off by saying, this is my opinion, okay? So I don't want people coming back to me saying, oh, you said X, Y, and Z was wrong or bad or whatever. <clears throat> to be honest with you, at the end of the day, I don't care how you wanna train, you train however you wanna train. I am offering you an alternative perspective, thus the tagline on this podcast. So I wanna start off right up front. This is my opinion. Okay, so as I see it, um, and I'm sure there are other niches that I'm not going to be addressing, but on the big broad spectrum scale, as I see it, there's basically five different uh, dog training um, objectives. Let's put them in that way. <clears throat> and uh, so number one is obedience slash having, you know, like a well-mannered pet, right? So that would be one. Uh, and that's probably where the vast majority of people fall in. They want a dog that's obedient. It's not going to jump up on them when they come home. Um, it's not going to go to the bathroom in the house. It's going to sit when they tell it to sit. And 
uh, you know, not chew things up in the house, all that sort of thing. So, um, and if, if that's what you're interested in, that was actually what Canine Academy Online was originally intended for. So that is the most developed uh, set of videos. We have uh, over 60, probably now over 75 videos uh, addressing all sorts of topics on um, how to train your dog uh, for obedience and, uh, and using some agility and some obstacles to develop and sharpen that obedience. So, um, but that would be number one, training for obedience slash having a well-mannered pet. Number two would be training for a service dog. So if you're training a dog to be a service dog, uh, as your end result, then you're gonna approach things in a specific way. Um, number three is a sport. Right, so you want to compete in Schutzen or IPO or KNPV or one of these other sports, um, then you're going to train a specific way. Number four is I'm going to call it protection. All right, so that would encompass for us, it would encompass personal protection, family protection, executive protection. It would also encompass, so for us, executive protection isn't um, part of an executive protection team, it is a dog that moves with the person they're actually protecting. So, but th that would also, from my opinion, protection broadly would cover dogs that are moving with an executive protection team as well. <clears throat> and then the fifth one is gonna be your law enforcement military working dog uh, end result. And those would even both be, uh, have their own nuances, they'd be separate, uh, but I'm going to lump them together for the purposes of this discussion um, because we specifically don't train for that unless there's a, uh, an interest in it. That's actually how I was brought into the dog training world. Um, training for very high-end uh, military level working dogs uh, so a lot of our philosophy does uh, pull from that uh, however uh, most of what I'm doing now um, varies off of that because families don't need tactical dogs they need family protection dogs and that's our primary clientele at this point all right so let's unpack each of these uh, a little bit and I'll kind of explain to you why I do what I do in each of them and kind of what the general synopsis is, you know, broadly, at least from my perspective and what I've seen. And I know that I haven't, I've definitely not seen it all, um, but I have a general idea of the, the broad spectrum of it. So obedience and, and uh, well-mannered pets. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still fighting this little something in my throat. Most people in this world tend toward, and, and at least most of the people that I interact with, right? They tend toward having the touchy, feely, nicey, my pet is my child kind of mentality, okay? And I'm not picking on that. I am just stating it as a fact. Most of the people that I interact with, when I'm doing dog training for the like obedience and all of that sort of thing, that is the prevailing mentality. Now, I feel like the clients who train with me kind of start to shift away from that as we go because they they start to slowly adopt my philosophy. Um, and I'm not saying that that is a bad way to view the dogs. However, I don't think it's the most productive way to view the dogs. So, um, one of the things where I would differ from most of those people is uh, I do not believe the dogs are equivalent to humans, <clears throat> right? Now, um, a lot of people would agree with this, but they would still treat their dogs as if they're humans. And I honestly believe that we disrespect the dog when we treat the dog like it is a human. <clears throat> I believe that we respect the dog the most when we treat it like a dog. Just like we disrespect a human when we treat them like a dog, we respect the human when we treat them like a human. So again, remember in our last episode we said you are where you are, right? And it's, that's an important thing to accept if you want to improve and become better and get to somewhere that you're not at yet. Well, you, you also are who you are, right? And so if you're listening to this podcast, you're almost definitely a human, at least if you can understand what I'm saying in this podcast, right? Dogs are not humans. Dogs do not reason the way humans reason. Dogs do not behave the way that humans behave. Um, there's a lot of things to derive off of this. I'm not gonna go too deep into it right now, but dogs do not believe that humans are dogs. 
Uh, a lot of the training philosophy of the alpha male and all of this kinds of stuff, or the alpha in the family, is based off this idea that dogs will view humans as dogs. Uh, that is simply not the case. Dogs interact with humans differently than they interact with dogs. And humans should, I believe, interact with dogs differently than they interact with humans. So we should not be treating our dogs as if they are humans. However, we should, and this is where I would agree with these people, um, we should be very conscious of how we treat our animals. Um, our dogs should be treated well, they should be well cared for, uh, their medical needs should be met, they should be fed, um, you know, a moderately good uh, diet, and I say moderately good because I don't think everybody's obligated to buy the most expensive dog food out there, but let's say the best dog food you can afford. And, um, and so, all of those things are true, I would completely agree with that, uh, but it is very important for us to understand that these dogs don't have a lot of the requirements that a lot of the other dogs that we're going to be discussing uh, in a few minutes have, right? As a general rule, <clears throat> most of these people don't take their dogs out in public very often. Now, maybe they do sometimes, right? Maybe they go to a dog park, which I generally don't recommend, but we won't get into that right now. Uh, maybe they take their dogs to Lowe's with them or uh, PetSmart, uh, places like that. And so, um, so maybe they would be interested in having a moderate level of socialization and stabilization, which I always recommend for all of my clients. Um, but it's not as necessary as it would be for someone who, for instance, has a service dog or a protection dog that they move with in public, right? So those things would be considered kind of like nice things to have in the dog, but wouldn't be mandatory if their dog just always stays at home. Right and, and uh, you know only sees you know close friends and, and and rare visitors and things like that. Well, those dogs, um, you know, it might be nice to have those things, but it's not absolutely critical. <clears throat> so the big thing for the obedience and pet dogs is our standard of what is acceptable can be a lot lower. I'm not saying it should be lower. But it can be lower and we shouldn't necessarily smash people who don't have ultra high standards on these dogs if they don't have a need for it. Right now some of my clients want good pets and then they find out down the road, hey, I could do therapy dogs. Well at that point if they want to do therapy dogs, depending on what they did before may have an impact on their ability to make that dog a therapy dog or not. Right? So if they fail to socialize and stabilize that dog properly when it was younger, they may not be able to get it to the point where they want it to be at to go and be a therapy dog. So those would be things that when I'm discussing this with a client, I try to bring up to them and, and let them think ahead a little bit. Um, but again, their standards do not have to be as high as they would be for service dogs, um, sport dogs, protection dogs, and law enforcement military dogs. All right, so let's move on to the second one, which is service dogs. So service dogs have to be stable and they have to be socialized. Right now, as a general rule, I don't let people pet my service dogs when I'm in public. I don't let people touch my service dogs when I'm in public, but they should be able to be pet and touched while you're in public. A good example of this is whenever I fly on airplanes, they will often want to touch the dog when I go through security, right? They, they're wearing their vest or whatever, and some of them are very thorough, some of them are not very thorough at all. But at the end of the day, my dog needs to be able to be touched. And this would go for, uh, for us anyway, for our protection dogs as well, because we move in public with our protection dogs. We train our protection dogs to move in public with their people. <clears throat> all right, so that's one, stabilization, socialization, very important. Another thing that would be very important for service dogs is that they have a relatively mild demeanor. Now, a lot of this is gonna depend on the person who's getting the service dog and the purpose of the service dog. So if you have a service dog for mobility, <clears throat> as a general rule, the more calm and mellow that dog is, the better a mobility service dog they would be. Right now, that's not always 100% the case, but it, it is often the case. Probably 90% of the time, it would be better. Um, now, if you have a dog that is assisting you with mobility, but is also a protection dog, um, then maybe th that wouldn't apply. That would be like one of those 
of the time case of whoa, breaking. So, um, but if you have a dog that's being trained for PTSD, right? My experience with most of the guys that I've worked with with PTSD and getting service dogs for them is what they're really struggling with that the dog primarily helps with is the hypervigilance aspect. So the anxiety is often driven from the hypervigilance and the sensation that they are not safe anywhere. So they have to constantly be on the lookout, constantly be looking around. And because of that, they end up fatigued and that fatigue often leads to depression and a lot of other issues, right? Because you just can't be on that high alert all the time um, without experiencing adrenal fatigue and a lot of other uh, issues. It also will affect their ability to sleep and, and uh, all of these sorts of things. So in those situations, they will very often benefit far more from a dog who tends to be more hypervigilant, such as a German Shepherd, a Dutch Shepherd, a Belgian Malinois, than they would from, say, a Labrador, who's a lot more laid back, right? Now, maybe a working line Labrador would work. I don't work with a lot of those, but they are very uh, aware, alert dogs as well. <clears throat> so when I look at the service dogs, even within that realm, I'm still asking, what's the end result of this service dog? Are we helping somebody in a wheelchair? Or are we helping a veteran with PTSD who really needs a battle buddy, right? And, and a battle buddy for them is, is somebody who's going to keep an eye out for them so that they don't have to keep an eye out on everything. They can just watch their dog, right? And then when their dog tells them, hey, you should pay attention to that, then they can look uh, and see what that specific thing is and address that and deal with it as necessary. Of course, which 99% of the time is gonna be, oh, it's okay, I see that, leave it alone. But service dogs need to be able to move in public. They need to be able to have a high level of discipline in their obedience. They need to be calm and mellow in terms of um, being able to move calmly and smoothly through a crowd and things of that nature. But then, <clears throat> depending on their final requirement, you may still want a dog that has a fairly high level of energy, even though we want that energy disciplined, um, than you would with, with other things. So one of the things that we do that a lot of other people don't is we actually, all of our service dogs that we've trained uh, have been Dutch Shepherds, German Shepherds, and Bel Belgian Malinois. Um, but we do talk to our clients about, you know, what is it exactly that you're trying to do here because we may not be a good match for you, right? <clears throat> The next one is sport dogs. Okay, so there may be some controversy over this. Um, and, you know, feel free to correct me if you're in the sport dog world and this doesn't apply to you. Uh, would love input from you guys on this. And also, this is not a bash on people in the sport world. My issue <clears throat> with the sport world is only in that a lot of people in the sport world say that their dogs are protection dogs. Now, what I'm not saying is that their dogs can't protect, right? Sure, those dogs could protect. They're, they're you know, been trained to bite, and so assuming that they're stable and that you can move in public with them, should the need arise, there is a moderately good chance that those dogs would attempt to do something to protect. So, um, but when we get over to the protection side, I think you'll see why I personally do not consider those dogs protection dogs. But, there's certain things that they do in the sport world that if you do it with protection dogs, the way that I'm going to describe them in a few minutes, you will often run into problems, which is why I don't use those training methodologies. So one example is they will very often use a toy or uh, food rewards, typically toys for the sport dogs, um, you know, a ball, a Kong, something they can chew on or, or you know, hang on or something like that. And I don't use any of those methodologies in what we do here. Um, probably my next episode needs to be the 12 pillars of dog training, which if you've seen my YouTube video, um, I go over them briefly there, but this is much more of a long uh, format um, type of, of uh, situation. So I can go into a little bit more depth on each of those and explain those out. And that will help bring some of this together if you're having questions and it doesn't sound like uh, this is all connecting for you. But uh, we don't use toys or treats uh, or food rewards <clears throat> for our dog. Now I've seen uh, some of the people that kind of bash not using those and they're like, oh, you know, that's like asking somebody to work for you for no pay. Here's why I disagree with that statement. We pay our dogs, 
we reward them for what they do. We just don't reward them the same way that they reward them. So first of all, I feed my dogs regardless of how they behave, right? If my, well, for the vast majority of the time, if they are food aggressive toward another dog, maybe they would lose food for that day or something like that. But that rarely, rarely happens if you bring them up properly in the beginning. So my dogs eat and it's not a condition of them doing, you know, sitting for me or laying for me or waiting for me, right? Um, so I don't, I don't ever hold food over their head as a condition for a standard obedience issue. <clears throat> Additionally, my dogs often have things to chew on, play with, you know, sometimes, the, especially when they're puppies, we give them the stuffed animals and they can bite on the stuffed animals and we kind of, you know, tug at them and play with them. But that is not, number one, it's not a reward for obedience. And number two, um, while it does have benefits when we start doing protection work with them, uh, such as they're used to tension on their teeth, uh, it does, it is not the methodology we use to bring them into the protection work. <clears throat> and the other area where the, uh, the sport techniques can cause problems down the road, and I see it a lot when people come to me with a dog that's been introduced to bite work in the sport world, and then they want to do protection work with me, um, we often have to break them off of the equipment. And, uh, and they're often very, very driven into that equipment. And so that can be quite a challenge. Oop, a lot brighter than I thought it would be. That can be quite a challenge um, for the handler and in the training. Uh, and sometimes it happens quickly, sometimes it takes a long time. Um, but breaking the dog off equipment can be very problematic. The reason I don't like that when it comes to personal protection is a personal protection dog in real world use has to bite somebody who's not wearing any equipment. And so the training that we do with the dogs from the very beginning is largely focused on continuing to have an element of it, of biting somebody who's not wearing a suit, right? And there's various different ways that we do that. Maybe we can get into those a little bit more down the road. But that, so those are the three primary things that I do differently from the sport world. Uh, again, most of them don't use food. That's a lot of the agility and obedience stuff. They'll, they may use food to introduce their obedience, but when it comes to a lot of the other stuff they're doing, especially bite work, they're usually using tugs and things of that nature. And essentially, <clears throat> from my perspective again, they're making the bite work a game, right? So if, if you buy into the drives philosophy, which I largely don't, I, I recognize they're describing um, behavior that they're seeing in the dogs. I think describing it as drives um, becomes problematic. And that can be another episode that I won't go on to a tangent on. But what the, what will happen is it basically, I view protection work or bite work, I view the dogs biting as having kind of two primary um, sources. One is they're either doing it out of play or they're doing it seriously, right? And because of what I'm training my dogs for, we always do bite work seriously. And um, even from the time they're puppies, uh, now it's all at the level that the dog can handle because all of our training methodology flows from a stress inoculation perspective. Um, so obviously if they can only handle a certain level of stress, then you're only working within the level of stress they can handle. And um, But your, your desired result is we're going to teach you to be able to handle and deal with more stress down the road. All right, so now let me get into the protection dogs just a little bit. One of my big issues um, and again, this is just a personal thing. This isn't smashing anybody uh, specifically. Um, but a lot of times what people will do that try to get the dogs over to, to be real true protection dogs, like they'll recognize they need to be different or have um, a different uh, skill set than a sport dog is they will go, okay, uh, we need to add this type of skill set into this dog, but they still go and get their dogs from the sport world. Um, and there's, there's a whole industry built around the green, you know, the breeding and the green dogs and then getting them and training them for the sport and then selling those dogs and then finishing those dogs um, for some specific work. Sometimes it's law enforcement, sometimes it's protection dogs and that sort of thing. And um, I have just seen a lot of issues develop and, and we'll get into some of these things specifically. Again, I'm, I'm trying not to get down in the weeds too much where it creates you know, these tangents and I end up talking for two hours. Um, but <clears throat> for us, I believe that the best approach, if you're going to train 
true protection dogs, especially, especially training dog or protection dogs that are going to be with families, right? Is we have a very strong belief in the foundation of the dog affecting the dog for the rest of its life. And the foundation is basically its first year of life, right? So we start training our dogs at six to eight weeks old. And most of that a very initial training is just learning to be um, polite and well behaved around a bunch of other dogs, around children, um, learning you know what's appropriate in a house, what's not appropriate in a house, and then we start working into their obedience, and then we start working into their their higher levels of training. So we have them. We I run my own breeding program, so we breed the dogs together that we want to put together. We select the puppies from the litters that we want to put into our training program, um, and we sell the, the remaining puppies. Uh, so there are puppies available from us two or three times a year. We typically do two to three litters a year. And then we raise that dog up from a puppy. So we have had control over its foundation. We have had control over its intro into the protection work. And then we have had control over finishing the protection work. So. That way I don't have to rely on somebody else who's done something that I don't know what they've done, right? Um, because dogs like people can have issues put into them early on that may not even show themselves with the trainer because the trainers typically know how to handle a dog. Then they give them to somebody who's not as familiar with handling a dog and they do something that brings out this issue and now they've got all kinds of problems that they're having to deal with. Whereas with my dogs, when my clients call me and say, I've, I'm having this issue, nine times out of 10, the discussion goes something like, yes, remember I told you not to do this when I was there? And they go, how did you know I was doing that? And I say, because the description of what you're telling me the dog is doing is their reaction to what you're doing. So you need to stop doing that or you need to accept what it's going to do to the dog's behavior if you continue doing that, right? <clears throat> so because I know my dogs and I know their foundation, I can envision what they're doing and why they're doing it almost immediately when a client has a question or a concern about some behavior uh, of one of our dogs. And then the only thing I'll kind of say about the LE, military working dog world, is <clears throat> my, my primary issues from, well, I guess I have two primary training issues um, with the kind of what I see as the generalized training practices. <sighs> Number one, and this really bothers me, hopefully this will help a whole bunch of people. If you are a law enforcement or military working dog handler and you're doing this, please stop it. But I get so frustrated when I see pictures posted of law enforcement and military working dogs doing bite training. And the person they're biting is wearing a sleeve and a uniform. And then, <clears throat> because here's what happens, 90% of those places, if asked, would say, we have a problem with our dogs biting our fellow officers or our fellow military members. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. You're training them to do that. Think, do not wear your uniform or allow anybody in your department to wear your uniform while taking bites off your dogs. You're conditioning those dogs to bite people in uniforms. There, I said it. Hopefully that will help a lot of you guys have less errant bites on fellow officers and fellow military members than you have had in the past. If you're having issues with that, you've already created the issue and you need help, I can help. We do consulting, we do on-site training. If your department is having an issue with that and you would like help breaking your dogs of that, um, again, you will never fully undo a foundation but you can make tremendous progress in getting over that. Okay, so that's number one, one of my biggest pet peeves in the military and law enforcement working dog world is they're doing, I understand why, they, I still disagree with a lot of the 
type of bite work they're, they're training into the dogs, the bite and hold and all that kind of stuff. But I understand why they do it. And so I'm like, okay, that's fine. I understand why you're doing it. You have limitations that I do not have and I don't want to have because I do personal protection dogs. My dogs don't have the limitations that most police dogs do, uh, specifically police dogs, military working dogs. It depends on whether they're like a drug dog that stays in uh, garrison all the time or whether they're a dog that goes overseas, right? So those dogs may have a little more flexibility and could do more of what I do. But I understand why just the sleeve a lot of times. But please, please stop wearing your uniforms when you're doing that work, okay? Get the uniforms of local gang members, you know, the outfits that they would wear, or things of that nature. If you're a military guy, get the uniforms of the local nationals uh, in the areas that you may be deploying to, and wear those things over your suit, over your sleeve, that sort of thing. All right. And the other thing that I have that's an issue, and it's not so much an issue for law enforcement because law enforcement can largely control the environment they're searching in when you're doing uh, drug or explosive searches. Um, but for military, if you're doing, for instance, uh, entry control point detection, uh, so like on Bagram Airfield, uh, we ran the entry control points on the Bagram, we ran explosive dogs on the entry control points, and in those settings, we, we also could control um, how we did the, uh, how the environment was, right? If we didn't like the environment, we could say, you go over there, you move over there, uh, and then we could run our searches. So in those settings, um, using a toy type of reward is not the end of the world. It can still be problematic when you're doing explosives, um, but there are ways to train it where it's, it's not terrible. However, if you are running a detection dog in the co combat area, so on patrol essentially, um, and this would apply to your special operations guys, Navy SEALs, special forces, all of those guys that are running canines. Um, and I've been out of the military now for eight years, I think. So, um, or no, six years. Anyway, so things may be going back to the way they were, but when I was getting out, they were beginning to add military working dogs and infantry units and all kinds of stuff like that, which I thought was great. But those dogs are largely moving with their units and doing detection at the same time. If you are one of those people, from my perspective and in my opinion, using a Kong or any other type of toy reward for explosive detection is highly problematic. Because if you're trying, oftentimes you may need to do detection under fire, right? Now maybe people just say, well, if you're under fire, we just won't do it, right? But you might be under fire and need to kick in a door and get into a building, especially if you're in an urban environment, right? And you may be doing it to get cover, or you may be doing it because that's the building you're entering, but all hell broke loose before you actually got inside, right? But you still wanna know if there was a booby trap on that door. So do we just go, well, this asset's useless. I mean, if that's what you're saying, you know, you might as well just let it go and leave it, right? I don't think that we should do that to our dogs, and I think that's selling the dog short in terms of their capacity and capability. The dog should be able to detect under fire. The dog should be able to operate under high levels of stress, but they are not going to operate under those levels of stress for a toy, almost always. And uh, you might find a few, uh, there's always exceptions to the rules, but as a general rule, if you're in that kind of environment and you're looking to do detection work, I would highly recommend working to the detection of the dogs under a whole different approach um, and not using toy rewards uh, for those specific dogs. So again, if that's you and you're interested in uh, consulting with us on how we would recommend that and how we would do that kind of training, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to discuss it to you in more detail. But hopefully this has started to paint the picture for how we do things, how they're a little bit different than how other people are doing them, um, why we do them a little bit differently, and, uh, and we can begin discussing some of these ideas on um, you know, maybe areas where I can shift a little bit closer to some other people's ways of thinking, and maybe areas where it would be beneficial to other people to shift away from their current way of thinking 
and more toward the way that we do our training and recommend working with the dogs. So hopefully that's been really helpful to you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have, um, please uh, give us a five-star review. Uh, Like this podcast. Uh, If you're watching the YouTube video, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And please subscribe if you're watching this or listening to this on podcast so that you don't miss any episodes. We will be trying to post these uh, every week. We also post a training video on our Fortress Canine YouTube channel and on our Canine Academy Online YouTube channel uh, once a week. And you can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook on both of those, uh, for both of those channels. Our Canine Academy um, training is where we work dog training for all breeds and uh, lots of different types of training. And then Fortress Canine is the side of the house for us where we train personal, family, and executive protection dogs uh, for sale. So I would love for you guys uh, to give me your feedback. Let me know what you think. Uh, Send me an email at joel at fortresscanine.com. And uh, you can also text me at 813-836-9244. I will see you guys next week. And until then, train hard.